Moby Dick by Herman Melville, Chapters 109 to 113. Chapter 109 Ahab and Starbuck in the Cabin. According to usage, they were pumping the ship the next morning, and lo, no inconsiderable oil came up with the water. The casks below must have sprung a bad leak. Much concern was shown, and Starbuck went down into the cabin to report this unfavorable affair. Footnote. In sperm whalemen, with any considerable quantity of oil on board, it is a regular semi-weekly duty to conduct a hose into the hold and drench the casks with seawater, which afterwards at varying intervals is removed by the ship's pumps. Hereby the casks are sought to be kept damply tight, while by the changed character of the withdrawn water the mariners readily detect any serious leakage in the precious cargo. End of footnote. Now, from the south and west, the Pequod was drawing nigh to Formosa and the Bashi Isles, between which lies one of the tropical outlets from the China waters into the Pacific. And so Starbuck found Ahab with a general chart of the Oriental archipelagos spread before him, and another separate one representing the long eastern coasts of the Japanese islands, Nifan, Matsmai, and Sikoke. With his snow-white new ivory leg braced against the screwed leg of his table, and with a long pruning hook of a jackknife in his hand, the wondrous old man, with his back to the gangway door, was wrinkling his brow and tracing his old courses again. "'Who's there?' hearing the footstep at the door, but not turning round to it. "'On deck! Be gone!' "'Captain Ahab mistakes. It is I. The oil in the hold is leaking, sir. We must up Burton's and break out.' "'Up Burton's and break out? Now that we are nearing Japan?' Heave to here for a week to tinker a parcel of old hoops? Either do that, sir, or waste in one day more oil than we may make good in a year. What we come twenty thousand miles to get is worth saving, sir. So it is, so it is, if we get it. I was speaking of the oil in the hold, sir. And I was not speaking or thinking of that at all. Be gone! Let it leak! I'm all a leak myself. I leaks and leaks, not only full of leaky casks, but those leaky casks are in a leaky ship, and that's a far worse plight than the Pequod's man. Yet I don't stop to plug my leak, for who can find it in the deep-loaded hull? Or how hope to plug it, even if found, in this life's howling gale? Starbuck, I'll not have the Burtons hoisted. What will the owners say, sir? Let the owners stand on Nantucket Beach and out-yell the typhoons. What cares Ahab? Owners! Owners! Thou art always prating to me, Starbuck, about those miserly owners, as if the owners were my conscience. But look ye, the only real owner of anything is its commander, and hark ye, my conscience is in this ship's keel. On deck! Captain Ahab, said the reddening mate, moving further into the cabin, with a daring so strangely respectful and cautious, that it almost seemed not only every way seeking to avoid the slightest outward manifestation of itself, but within also seemed more than half distrustful of itself. A better man than I might well pass over in thee, what he would quickly enough resent in a younger man— I, and in a happier, Captain Ahab. Devils! Dost thou then so much as dare to critically think of me? On deck! Nay, sir, not yet. I do entreat. And I do dare, sir, to be forbearing. Shall we not understand each other better than hitherto, Captain Ahab? Ahab seized a loaded musket from the rack, forming part of most South Seamen's cabin furniture, and, pointing it towards Starbuck, exclaimed, There is one God that is Lord over the earth, and one Captain that is Lord over the Pequod. On deck! For an instant, in the flashing eyes of the mate, and his fiery cheeks, 
you would have almost thought that he had really received the blaze of the leveled tube. But, mastering his emotion, he half calmly rose, and as he quitted the cabin, paused for an instant, and said, Thou hast outraged, not insulted me, sir. But for that I ask thee not to beware of Starbuck. Thou wouldst but laugh. But let Ahab beware of Ahab. Beware of thyself, old man. He waxes brave, but nevertheless obeys. <laughs> Most careful bravery, that, murmured Ahab, as Starbuck disappeared. What's that, he said? Ahab, beware of Ahab. There's something there. Then, unconsciously using the musket for a staff, with an iron brow he paced to and fro in the little cabin. But presently the thick pleats of his forehead relaxed, and returning the gun to the rack, he went on deck. "'Thou art but too good a fellow, Starbuck,' he said lowly to the mate. Then, raising his voice to the crew, "'Furl the t'gallant sails, and close reef the topsails, fore and aft. Back the main-yard. Up Burton's, and break out in the main hold.' It were perhaps vain to surmise exactly why it was that, as respecting Starbuck, Ahab thus acted. It may have been a flash of honesty in him, or a mere prudential policy which, under the circumstance, imperiously forbade the slightest symptom of open disaffection, however transient, in the important chief officer of his ship. However it was, his orders were executed, and the Burtons were hoisted. Chapter 110. Queequeg in His Coffin Upon searching, it was found that the casks last struck into the hold were perfectly sound, and that the leak must be further off. So, it being calm weather, they broke out deeper and deeper, disturbing the slumbers of the huge ground-tier butts, and from that black midnight sending those gigantic moles into the daylight above, so deep did they go, and so ancient and corroded and weedy the aspect of the lowermost puncheons, that you almost looked next for some mouldy cornerstone cask containing coins of Captain Noah, with copies of the posted placards vainly warning the infatuated old world from the flood. Tierce after tierce, too, of water and bread and beef and shooks of staves and iron bundles of hoops were hoisted out, till at last the piled decks were hard to get about, and the hollow hull echoed underfoot, as if you were treading over empty catacombs, and reeled and rolled in the sea like an air-freighted demijohn. Top-heavy was the ship as a dinnerless student with all Aristotle in his head. Well was it that the typhoons did not visit them then. Now at this time it was that my poor pagan companion and fast-bosom friend Queequeg was seized with a fever, which brought him nigh to his endless end. Be it said that in this vocation of whaling sinecures are unknown. Dignity and danger go hand in hand. Till you get to be captain, the higher you rise, the harder you toil. So with poor Queequeg, who, as harpooner, must not only face all the rage of the living whale, but, as we have elsewhere seen, mount his dead back in a rolling sea, and finally descend into the gloom of the hold, and, bitterly sweating all day in that subterraneous confinement, resolutely manhandle the clumsiest casks and see to their stowage. To be short, among whalemen, the harpooners are the holders, so called. Poor Queequeg! When the ship was about half disemboweled, you should have stooped over the hatchway and peered down upon him there, where, stripped to his woolen drawers, the tattooed savage was crawling about amid that dampness and slime, like a green-spotted lizard at the bottom of a well. And a well or an ice-house it somehow proved to him, poor pagan, where, strange to say, for all the heat of his sweatings, he caught a terrible chill which lapsed into a fever, and at last, after some days suffering, laid him in his hammock, close to the very sill of the door of death. How he wasted and wasted away in those few long lingering days, till there seemed but little left of him but his frame and tattooing. 
but as all else in him thinned and his cheekbones grew sharper, his eyes nevertheless seemed growing fuller and fuller. They became of a strange softness of luster, and mildly but deeply looked out at you there from his sickness, a wondrous testimony to that immortal health in him which could not die or be weakened. And, like circles on the water which, as they grow fainter, expand, so his eyes seemed rounding and rounding like the rings of eternity. An awe that cannot be named would steal over you, as you sat by the side of this waning savage, and saw as strange things in his face as any beheld who were bystanders when Zoroaster died. For whatever is truly wondrous and fearful in man, never yet was put into words or books. And the drawing near of death, which alike levels all, alike impresses all with a last revelation, which only an author from the dead could adequately tell. So that, let us say it again, no dying Chaldee or Greek had higher and holier thoughts than those whose mysterious shades you saw creeping over the face of poor Queequeg, as he quietly lay in his swaying hammock, and the rolling sea seemed gently rocking him to his final rest, and the ocean's invisible flood-tide lifted him higher and higher towards his destined heaven. Not a man of the crew but gave him up, and as for Queequeg himself, what he thought of the case was forcibly shown by a curious favor he asked. He called one to him in the gray morning watch when the day was just breaking, and taking his hand said that while in Nantucket he had chanced to see certain little canoes of dark wood, like the rich war wood of his native isle, and upon inquiry he had learned that all whalemen who died in Nantucket were laid in those same dark canoes, and that the fancy of being so laid had much pleased him, for it was not unlike the custom of his own race who, after embalming a dead warrior, stretched him out in his canoe, and so left him to be floated away to the starry archipelagos. For not only do they believe that the stars are isles, but that far beyond all visible horizons, their own mild, uncontinented seas interflow with the blue heavens, and so form the white breakers of the Milky Way. He added that he shuddered at the thought of being buried in his hammock, according to the usual sea custom, tossed like something vile to the death-devouring sharks. No, he desired a canoe, like those of Nantucket, all the more congenial to him, being a whaleman, that like a whaleboat these coffin canoes were without a keel, though that involved but uncertain steering and much leeway adown the dim ages. Now when this strange circumstance was made known aft, the carpenter was at once commanded to do Queequeg's bidding, whatever it might include. There was some heathenish, coffin-colored old lumber aboard, which upon a long previous voyage had been cut from the aboriginal groves of the Lackaday Islands, and from these dark planks the coffin was recommended to be made. No sooner was the carpenter apprised of the order, than taking his rule he forthwith, with all the indifferent promptitude of his character, proceeded into the forecastle and took Queequeg's measure with great accuracy, regularly chalking Queequeg's person as he shifted the rule. "'Ah, poor fellow! He'll have to die now!' ejaculated the Long Island sailor. Going to his vice-bench, the carpenter, for convenience' sake and general reference, now transferringly measured on it the exact length the coffin was to be, and then made the transfer permanent by cutting two notches at its extremities. This done, he marshaled the planks in his tools, and to work. When the last nail was driven, and the lid duly planed and fitted, he lightly shouldered the coffin and went forward with it inquiring whether they were ready for it yet in that direction. Overhearing the indignant but half-humorous cries with which the people on deck began to drive the coffin away, Queequeg, to everyone's consternation, commanded that the thing should be instantly brought to him, nor was there any denying him, seeing that of all mortals some dying men are the most tyrannical, and certainly since they will shortly trouble us so little for evermore the poor fellows ought to be indulged. Leaning over in his hammock, Queequeg long regarded the coffin with an attentive eye. He then called for his harpoon, and had the wooden stock drawn from it, 
and then had the iron part placed in the coffin along with one of the paddles of his boat. All by his own request also, biscuits were then ranged round the sides within, a flask of fresh water was placed at the head, and a small bag of woody earth scraped up in the hold at the foot and a piece of sailcloth being rolled up for a pillow, Queequeg now entreated to be lifted into his final bed, that he might make trial of its comforts, if any it had. He lay without moving a few minutes, then told one to go to his bag and bring out his little god, Yojo. Then, crossing his arms on his breast with Yojo between, he called for the coffin lid, hatch he called it, to be placed over him the head part turned over with a leather hinge and there lay queequeg in his coffin with little but his composed countenance in view rarmai it will do it is easy he murmured at last and signed to be replaced in his hammock but ere this was done pip who had been slyly hovering near by all this while drew nigh to him where he lay and with soft sobbings took him by the hand in the other holding his tambourine. Poor rover, will ye never have done with all this weary roving? Where go ye now? But if the currents carry ye to those sweet Antilles, where the beaches are only beat with water-lilies, will ye do one little errand for me? Seek out one Pip, who's now been missing long. I think he's in those far Antilles. If ye find him, then comfort him, for he must be very sad. For look, He's left his tambourine behind. I found it. Rig a dig dig. Now, Queequeg, die, and I'll beat your dying march. I have heard, murmured Starbuck, gazing down the scuttle, that in violent fevers men, all ignorance, have talked in ancient tongues, and that when the mystery is probed, it turns out always that in their wholly forgotten childhood those ancient tongues had been really spoken in their hearing by some lofty scholars. So to my fond faith poor Pip, in this strange sweetness of his lunacy, brings heavenly vouchers of all our heavenly homes. Where learned he that but there? Hark, he speaks again, but more wildly now. Form two and two! Let's make a general of him. Ho! Oh, where's his harpoon? Lay it across here. rig a dig dig Huzzah! Oh, for a gamecock now to sit upon his head and crow. Queequeg dies game. Mind ye that. Queequeg dies game. Take ye good heed of that. Queequeg dies game, I say. Game, game, game. But base little Pip, he died a coward. Died all a shiver. Out upon Pip. Hark ye. If you find Pip, tell all the Antilles he's a runaway, a coward, a coward, a coward. Tell them he jumped from a whaleboat. I'd never beat my tambourine over base Pip, and hail him general, if he were once more dying here. No, no, shame upon all cowards, shame upon them. Let him go drown like Pip that jumped from a whaleboat. Shame, shame. During all this, Queequeg lay with closed eyes as if in a dream, Pip was led away, and the sick man was replaced in his hammock. But now that he had apparently made every preparation for death, now that his coffin was proved a good fit, Queequeg suddenly rallied. Soon there seemed no need of the carpenter's box, and thereupon, when some expressed their delighted surprise, he, in substance, said that the cause of his sudden convalescence was this. At a critical moment he had just recalled a little duty ashore, which he was leaving undone, and therefore had changed his mind about dying. He could not die yet, he averred. They asked him, then, whether to live or die was a matter of his own sovereign will and pleasure. He answered, certainly. In a word, it was Queequeg's conceit that if a man made up his mind to live, mere sickness could not kill him. Nothing but a whale, or a gale, or some violent, ungovernable, unintelligent destroyer of that sort. Now, there is this noteworthy difference between savage and civilized, that while a sick civilized man may be six months convalescing, generally speaking, a sick savage is almost half well again in a day. So, in good time, my Queequeg gains strength, 
and at length, after sitting on the windlass for a few indolent days, but eating with a vigorous appetite, he suddenly leaped to his feet, threw out his arms and legs, gave himself a good stretching, yawned a little bit, and then springing into the head of his hoisted boat, and poising a harpoon, pronounced himself fit for a fight. With a wild whimsiness he now used his coffin for a sea-chest, and emptying into it his canvas bag of clothes, set them in order there. Many spare hours he spent in carving the lid with all manner of grotesque figures and drawings, and it seemed that hereby he was striving, in his rude way, to copy parts of the twisted tattooing on his body. And this tattooing had been the work of a departed prophet and seer on his island, who, by those hieroglyphic marks, had written out on his body a complete theory of the heavens and the earth, and a mystical treatise on the art of attaining truth, so that Queequeg in his own proper person was a riddle to unfold, a wondrous work in one volume, but whose mysteries not even himself could read, though his own live heart beat against them. And these mysteries were therefore destined in the end to moulder away with the living parchment whereon they were inscribed, and so be unsolved to the last. And this thought it must have been which suggested to Ahab that wild exclamation of his, when one morning turning away from surveying poor Queequeg, Oh, devilish tantalization of the gods! Chapter 111 the Pacific. When gliding by the Bashi Isles, we emerged at last upon the great South Sea. Were it not for other things, I could have greeted my dear Pacific with uncounted thanks, for now the long supplication of my youth was answered. That serene ocean rolled eastwards from me a thousand leagues of blue. There is one knows not what sweet mystery about this sea whose gentle, awful stirring seemed to speak of some hidden soul beneath, like those fabled undulations of the Ephesian sod over the buried evangelist St. John. And meet it is that over these sea pastures, wide rolling watery prairies and potter's fields of all four continents, the waves should rise and fall, and ebb and flow unceasingly. For here millions of mixed shades and shadows, drowned dreams, somnambulisms, reveries, all that we call lives and souls, lie dreaming, dreaming still, tossing like slumberers in their beds, the ever-rolling waves but made so by their restlessness. To any meditative Magian rover this serene Pacific, once beheld, must ever after be the sea of his adoption. It rolls the midmost waters of the world, the Indian Ocean and Atlantic being but its arms. The same waves wash the moles of the new-built Californian towns, but yesterday planted by the recentest race of men, and lave the faded but still gorgeous skirts of Asiatic lands older than Abraham, while all between float milky ways of coral isles and low-lying, endless, unknown archipelagos and impenetrable Japans. Thus this mysterious, divine Pacific zones the world's whole bulk about, makes all coasts one bay to it, seems the tide-beating heart of earth. Lifted by those eternal swells, you needs must own the seductive god, bowing your head to Pan. But few thoughts of Pan stirred Ahab's brain, as, standing like an iron statue at his accustomed place beside the mizzen-rigging, with one nostril he unthinkingly snuffed the sugary musk from the bashy isles, in whose sweet woods mild lovers must be walking, and with the other consciously inhaled the salt breath of the new-found sea, that sea in which the hated white whale must even then be swimming. Launched at length upon these almost final waters, and gliding towards the Japanese cruising ground, the old man's purpose intensified itself. His firm lips met like the lips of a vice. The delta of his forehead's veins swelled like overladen brooks. In his very sleep, his ringing cry ran through the vaulted hull. Stern all! The white whale spouts thick blood! Chapter 112 The Blacksmith 
Availing himself of the mild, summer-cool weather that now reigned in these latitudes, and in preparation for the peculiarly active pursuit shortly to be anticipated, Perth, the begrimed, blistered old blacksmith, had not removed his portable forge to the hold again after concluding his contributory work for Ahab's leg, but still retained it on deck, fast lashed to ring-bolts by the foremast, being now almost incessantly invoked by the headsmen and harpooners and bowsmen to do some little job for them, altering or repairing or new-shaping their various weapons and boat furniture. Often he would be surrounded by an eager circle, all waiting to be served, holding boat spades, pike heads, harpoons, and lances, and jealously watching his every sooty movement as he toiled. Nevertheless, this old man's was a patient hammer wielded by a patient arm. No murmur, no impatience, no petulance did come from him. Silent, slow, and solemn, bowing over still further his chronically broken back, he toiled away, as if toil were life itself, and the heavy beating of his hammer the heavy beating of his heart. And so it was. Most miserable. A peculiar walk in this old man, a certain slight but painful appearing yawing in his gait, had at an early period of the voyage excited the curiosity of the mariners, and to the importunity of their persisted questionings he had finally given in. So it came to pass that every one now knew the shameful story of his wretched fate. Belated, and not innocently, one bitter winter's midnight, on the road running between two country towns, the blacksmith half-stupidly felt the deadly numbness stealing over him, and sought refuge in a leaning, dilapidated barn. The issue was the loss of the extremities of both feet. Out of this revelation, part by part, at last came out the four acts of the gladness, and the one long and as yet uncatastrophied fifth act of the grief of his life's drama. He was an old man who, at the age of nearly sixty, had postponedly encountered that thing in sorrow's technicals called ruin. He had been an artisan of famed excellence, and with plenty to do, owned a house and garden, embraced a youthful, daughter-like, loving wife, and three blithe, ruddy children, every Sunday went to a cheerful-looking church planted in a grove. But one night, under cover of darkness, and further concealed in a most cunning disguisement, a desperate burglar slid into his happy home, and robbed them all of everything. And darker yet to tell, the blacksmith himself did ignorantly conduct this burglar into his family's heart. It was the bottle conjurer. Upon the opening of that fatal cork, forth flew the fiend and shriveled up his home. Now, for prudent, most wise, and economic reasons, the blacksmith's shop was in the basement of his dwelling, but with a separate entrance to it, so that always had the young and loving, healthy wife listened with no unhappy nervousness, but with vigorous pleasure, to the stout ringing of her young-armed old husband's hammer whose reverberations, muffled by passing through the floors and walls, came up to her not unsweetly in her nursery. And so to stout labor's iron lullaby the blacksmith's infants were rocked to slumber. Oh, woe on woe! O oh, death, why canst thou not sometimes be timely? Hadst thou taken this old blacksmith to thyself ere his full ruin came upon him, then had the young widow had a delicious grief, and her orphans a truly venerable, legendary sire to dream of in their after years, and all of them a care-killing competency. But death plucked down some virtuous elder brother, on whose whistling daily toil solely hung the responsibilities of some other family, and left the worse-than-useless old man standing, till the hideous rot of life should make him easier to harvest. Why tell the whole? The blows of the basement hammer every day grew more and more between, and each blow every day grew fainter than the last. The wife sat frozen at the window, with tearless eyes, glitteringly gazing into the weeping faces of her children. The bellows fell, the forge choked up with cinders, the house was sold, the mother dived down into the long churchyard grass, her children twice followed her thither and the houseless, familyless old man 
staggered off a vagabond in crape, his every woe unreverenced, his gray head a scorn to flaxen curls. Death seems the only desirable sequel for a career like this, but death is only a launching into the region of the strange untried. It is but the first salutation to the possibilities of the immense remote, the wild, the watery, the unshored. Therefore, to the death-longing eyes of such men, who still have left in them some interior compunctions against suicide, does the all-contributed and all-receptive ocean alluringly spread forth his whole plane of unimaginable, taking terrors, and wonderful, new-life adventures, and from the hearts of infinite pacifics, the thousand mermaids sing to them, Come hither, broken-hearted, here is another life without the guilt of intermediate death. Here are wonders supernatural, without dying for them. Come hither, bury thyself in a life which, to your now equally abhorred and abhorring landed world, is more oblivious than death. Come hither, put up thy gravestone too within the churchyard, and come hither till we marry thee. Hearkening to these voices, east and west, by early sunrise, and by fall of eve, the blacksmith's soul responded, I, I come. And so Perth went a-wailing. Chapter 113 The Forge With matted beard, and swathed in a bristling shark-skin apron, about midday, Perth was standing between his forge and anvil, the latter placed upon an ironwood log, with one hand holding a pike-head in the coals, and with the other at his forge's lungs, when Captain Ahab came along, carrying in his hand a small, rusty-looking leathern bag. While yet a little distance from the forge, Moody Ahab paused, till at last Perth, withdrawing his iron from the fire, began hammering it upon the anvil the red mass sending off the sparks in thick, hovering flights, some of which flew close to Ahab. "'Are these thy mother Carrie's chickens, Perth? They are always flying in thy wake. Birds of good omen, too, but not to all. Look here, they burn. But thou, thou livest among them without a scorch.' "'Because I am scorched all over, Captain Ahab.' answered Perth, resting for a moment on his hammer. I am past scorching. Not easily canst thou scorch a scar. Well, well, no more. Thy shrunk voice sounds too calmly, sanely woeful to me. In no paradise myself, I am impatient of all misery in others that is not mad. Thou shouldst go mad, blacksmith. Say, why dost thou not go mad? How canst thou endure without being mad? Do the heavens yet hate thee, that thou canst not go mad? What wert thou making there? Welding an old pikehead, sir. There were seams and dents in it. And canst thou make it all smooth again, blacksmith, after such hard usage as it had? I think so, sir. And I suppose thou canst smooth almost any seams and dents, Never mind how hard the metal, blacksmith. Ay, sir, I think I can. All seems and dents but one. Look ye here, then, cried Ahab, passionately advancing, and leaning with both hands on Perth's shoulders. Look ye here, here. Can you smooth out a seam like this, blacksmith? Sweeping one hand across his ribbed brow. If thou couldst, blacksmith, glad enough would I lay my head upon thy anvil, and feel thy heaviest hammer between my eyes. Answer! Canst thou smooth this seam? Oh, that is the one, sir. Said I not all seams and dents but one? Aye, blacksmith, it is the one. Aye, man, it is unsmoothable. For though thou only seest it here in my flesh, it is worked down into the bone of my skull. That is all wrinkles. But away with child's play. No more gaffs and pikes today. Look ye here. 
jingling the leathern bag, as if it were full of gold coins. I, too, want a harpoon made, one that a thousand yoke of fiends could not part, Perth, something that will stick in a whale like his own fin-bone. There's the stuff, flinging the pouch upon the anvil. Look ye, blacksmith, these are the gathered nail-stubs of the steel shoes of racing horses. Horseshoe stubs, sir. Why, Captain Ahab, thou hast there, then, the best and stubbornest stuff we blacksmiths ever work. I know it, old man. These stubs will weld together like glue from the melted bones of murderers. Quick, forge me the harpoon, and forge me first twelve rods for its shank. Then wind and twist and hammer these twelve together, like the yarns and strands of a tow-line. Quick, I'll blow the fire. When at last the twelve rods were made, Ahab tried them one by one, by spiraling them with his own hand round a long, heavy iron bolt. A flaw, rejecting the last one. Work that over again, Perth. This done, Perth was about to begin welding the twelve into one, when Ahab stayed his hand and said he would weld his own iron. As then, with regular gasping hems, he hammered on the anvil, Perth passing to him the glowing rods, one after the other, and the hard-pressed forge shooting up its intense straight flame, the Parsi passed silently, and bowing over his head towards the fire, seemed invoking some curse, or some blessing, on the toil. But as Ahab looked up, he slid aside. "'What's that bunch of Lucifers dodging about there for?' muttered Stubb, looking on from the forecastle. "'That Parsi smells fire like a fusee, and smells of it himself like a hot musket's powder-pan.' At last the shank in one complete rod received its final heat, and as Perth, to temper it, plunged it all hissing into the cask of water nearby, the scalding steam shot up into Ahab's bent face." Wouldst thou brand me, Perth? Wincing for a moment with the pain. Have I been but forging my own branding iron, then? Pray God, not that. Yet I fear something, Captain Ahab. Is not this harpoon for the white whale? For the white fiend. But now for the barbs. Thou must make them thyself, man. Here are my razors, the best of steel. Here! and make the barb sharp as the needle-sleet of the icy sea. For a moment the old blacksmith eyed the razors, as though he would fain not use them. Take them, man! I have no need for them, for I now neither shave, sup, nor pray till— But here! To work! Fashioned at last into an arrowy shape, and welded by Perth to the shank, the steel soon pointed the end of the iron, and as the blacksmith was about giving the barbs their final heat prior to tempering them, he cried to Ahab to place the water cask near. No, no, no water for that. I want it of the true death temper. Ahoy there, Tashtego, Queequeg, Dagu. What say ye, pagans? Will you give me as much blood as will cover this barb? holding it high up. A cluster of dark nods replied, Yes. Three punctures were made in the heathen flesh, and the white whale's barbs were then tempered. Ego non baptizo te in nomine patris sed in nomine diaboli, deliriously howled Ahab, as the malignant iron scorchingly devoured the baptismal blood. Now, mustering the spare poles from below, and selecting one of hickory, with the bark still investing it, Ahab fitted the end to the socket of the iron. A coil of new tow-line was then unwound, and some fathoms of it taken to the windlass, and stretched to a great tension. Pressing his foot upon it, till the rope hummed like a harp-string, then eagerly bending over it, and seeing no strandings, Ahab exclaimed, Good! and now for the seizings. At one extremity the rope was unstranded, and the separate spread yarns were all braided and woven round the socket of the harpoon. The pole was then driven hard up into the socket. From the lower end the rope was traced halfway along the pole's length, 
and firmly secured so, with intertwistings of twine. This done, pole, iron, and rope, like the three fates, remained inseparable, and Ahab moodily stalked away with the weapon. The sound of his ivory leg, and the sound of the hickory pole, both hollowly ringing along every plank. But ere he entered his cabin, light, unnatural, half-bantering, yet most piteous sound was heard. O oh, Pip! Thy wretched laugh, thy idle but unresting eye, all thy strange mummeries not unmeaningly blended with the black tragedy of the melancholy ship, and mocked it. End of chapters 109 to 113